that with a blink of an eye, the month seems to have just fleeted away. We're talking today about a subject we had broached some time ago, in fact, last year, and continued from time to time to look at it, and it has to do with Wall Street, and in particular, General Electric. The stock market is humming, and all's well on Wall Street if we are to believe herds of financial analysts and forecasters. There'll be an occasional dip, of course, but when has there never been an occasional dip, they say. The market is only responding to dynamic and momentary shifts that occur in markets all over the world. And just the same, things are pretty steady, in fact, quite hopeful. Uh, These Wall Street experts are about where things stand. But Charles Ortel, a retired Wall Street banker who in recent years has turned his attention to charity fraud, says we we shouldn't so quickly believe that hype. He's he's been saying to us, and he started telling us this about two years ago, to prepare for a major market disruption. And today he says it is closer and even bigger than he expected. Eleven years ago, Ortel not only sounded the alarm, but pinpointed where, why, and how it would happen. And General Electric, he said, would be the eye of the storm. So today... We're following up on this prediction. Is General Electric at the eye of the storm? Is the big collapse inevitable? Will it happen soon? Will it be as devastating as predicted? All these questions we are going to tackle today. And the reason we are doing this, because most people I know, myself included, (laughs) Yeah, I do know myself. Uh, the market is an ethereal thing. We, we're not involved on a daily basis with the market or even on a, an occasional basis with the stock market. Our lives just simply don't go in that direction. But we recognize that whether a person is in the stock market or not, the stock market itself is a critical barometer of where life is going for the entire nation, whether we are involved in it or not. And I wanted to return to the original reason we connected with each other, which was this uh, uh, issue of General Electric. It was General Electric that Charles Ortel called out for what he considered to be highly irregular uh, business practices and that were in danger of tainting the entire market. Charles, thanks for being with us today. Well, it's my great honor, you treat to be back on your... <laughs> well, um, I wanted to know... Since the, we, since the time we started talking about General Electric, could you give us a, a, a very fast overview of how you came to be involved in, in following General Electric and then came to be involved in outing General Electric? And at sure. a time when everybody said, you were kind of a nut. <laughs> That's been the entire course of my life, I believe. But anyway, (laughs) uh, I think uh, for those of us who spend time in the investing world, as I did and I I do now dabble from time to time, um, if you have a a flair for numbers, and many people do not, but if you're comfortable with basic arithmetic, understanding whether uh, stocks, stock um, 
publicly traded stocks of companies are overvalued or undervalued is actually a pretty simple exercise. Um, publicly traded companies have to produce lots and lots of information uh, on a quarterly basis and on an annual basis, and then they file periodic reports, and when they go public or they sell securities, there, there are other reports. So unlike you know trying to establish what the value of a piece of art may be worth, and again, there are comparables for art, uh, there's just a raft of information out there, and the bigger the company, more more often than not, more uh, the more the information is out there. So in the case of General Electric, it was uh, when I started on this one of the biggest companies ever, uh, because you have to look at General Electric not simply at their the value of their stock, but they, when I got into it, they had I think over 500 billion dollars in debt, in addition to their stock. Which was worth about 400 billion. So all told, the value of that enterprise was approached a trillion dollars. And a trillion, you know, for people down in Washington D.C., it's nothing. But for ordinary human beings, and even for really rich billionaires, a trillion dollars is a lot of money. And so uh, what happened, Eutrice, was I had uh, been concerned about the, the state of the markets, not simply because Bill Clinton was president, but just the, I didn't like. The, the the way I saw markets evolving in 97, 98, 99, 2000. And then, of course, after the events of September 11th and, and other um, elements which made me very concerned about the state of the, the geopolitical order, I was able to retire in, in 2002 at the age of 46. And so for the first four years or so of my retirement, I really didn't spend any time thinking about the markets became a moment where you have to back and get serious about life again. And, and I, I began an exercise late in 2006, early in 2007, where I said, you know what, I want to figure out for myself, got plenty of time now, uh, are the markets overvalued or undervalued? And so I selected 25 large American companies that were engaged in business on a multinational basis around the world. And I went through an exercise of valuing each one of them, you know, tell, figure out what I thought each was worth, and then comparing that valuation to what the stock market was saying the company was worth. And I initially, when I got to GE's filings, they were, they were then enormously complicated. Uh, I, I almost just threw up my hands and said, you know what, this is not really an industrial company, it's a bank. I'm, uh, you know, I'm just not going to waste my time on this. But because I am stubborn, um, I said, you know, I, I'm going to figure this out. And it took me a while, but before long, I was able to see that a, a clear path in understanding just how overvalued value GE was back then was to take the, the financial part of GE, which was its biggest piece, and value that piece using the metrics that people like me and others use to value banks. And it, it, those metrics are actually very simple. With a bank, what you do is you look at the, the value of its common stock, uh, which is called its book value on the balance sheet. You subtract out from that value any soft assets, goodwill and tangible assets, and you arrive at a number called tangible book value. You divide that by the number of shares outstanding. You get tang tangible book value per share. And back then, most banks would be trading at, say, one and, one and a quarter to two times tangible book value if they were solvent banks for the future. So I, I used a conservative, i.e., you know, a high multiple to value GE's bank, even though its bank, I, uh, its financial assets back, I thought were in horrible shape to be conservative. I said, well, let's, let's give them a good valuation. Subtract that from the market value of the whole company, and then let's see what that implies for a multiple of the industrial piece of GE, which everyone thought was their biggest piece. When I did that, I just re recoiled in horror because the the market was overvaluing, as we've discussed, GE's industrial businesses by hundreds of billions of dollars. And indeed, when you looked under the hood um, at at the industrial, GE never bothered to give give the public uh, a, a grounded, a granular uh, review of the industrial businesses, and the service businesses roll either separately and then rolled up to the total. They never bothered to do it. And I figured out a very simple way of doing that was to subtract the books and records for the finance piece, which are were, were published, from the whole consolidated report, which was published. And just by doing arithmetic, and you had to do a lot of it, 
uh, I was able to tease out the trends that were implied in the course of the industrial business's evolution through 2006, I guess it was initially, and then I began to update it. And what what I saw just shocked me because, you know, I, I'd had personal dealing with GE in the course of my career, and uh, when you deal with those people, they're extremely arrogant in the main, and they would boast about how they they were the only large company that remained AAA rated, i.e. the highest rating for its debt. Uh, they were an original member. They are an original member of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. They're covered by, you know, avidly by many, many different research houses, most of whom were giving them good ratings. And, you know, when I first you know, unpacked what I, what I saw, I literally went to a friend of mine who's very sober and Known him for a long time. Uh, the, you know, he, was a, he is the former senior executive at a big company and experienced in banking as well. And I went to him and I said, "You know, you're going to think I'm crazy." And he interrupted me. He said, "We all know you're crazy, Joe." <laughs> <laughs> but but then, <laughs> I took him through the whole GE analysis, and he said, "Well, Charles, you're crazy, but on this one, you're also correct." So uh, I, I tested my thesis out on a lot of very uh, experienced people before I went public with it. And and part of what is so problematic for GE, it's not like, you know, if you and I put together a company, trees, you know, and we scraped together, let's say, some money from outside investors, we would have a lot of excuses for failing because we're a new business, you know, we're not as well capitalized, we don't have experience working together. With GE, you can't say that. I mean, GE uh, has had for decades the ability with its robust finances in theory to hire the best people, to hire the best advisors, uh, to study things 65 thousand ways from Sunday before doing anything. And uh, on top of which they had and have still commanding market positions in many global businesses. So uh, people I, whose uh, experience I value highly have explained to me and documented to me that there, there really normally is a very substantial difference in the quality of business enjoyed by the number one player in a global market compared to the number two. And you can see that when you, you hire consultants to go through it with you. Um, so here's a business, GE, that consists of many, many number one global leading brands around the world, yet its financial statements were horrible. The revenues were declining. The profits margins were declining. Uh, where they used to make money in the U.S., the biggest market in the world, they had shifted their uh, operations to, to record their profits internationally, so they were making money outside this country and losing money inside this country. Though they were declaring a, a pre-tax profit, they were paying no corporate income taxes. They hadn't taken care of their retirees. Their pension plans were underfunded massively. They had gigantic contingent liabilities for environmental and other matters. And it was enormously complicated. And, you know, people with experience will, will confirm that complexity is, is not good when it comes to business. What you want is simple, straightforward businesses that provide good products and services to their customers. The customers appreciate those products and servers, services. You're able then to, to sell more and more of these products and services to more and more people, uh, and to add bells and whistles, uh, to invest in your businesses, to invest in your communities, to develop loyalty among your employees, reverence inside the countries for the way in which you conduct business. Uh, you get good deals as a result of that. People are pleased to sell out to you when it comes time to sell a business because they see that you operate best of breed. None of the, that was, you know, the, the headlines, you know, and all the marketing puff pieces that would come out of GE would talk that kind of stuff. But then when you looked at the report card, at the real financial results of GE, it was horrible. And uh, so what ha what happened there is that uh, – GE nearly, in my opinion, nearly went bankrupt in 2008, but was rescued through intercession of our government via the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. They allowed GE to sell debt, uh, GE Capital backstopped by, in effect, backstopped by the government in a way that I would not have allowed them to do. And so they bought some time. Uh, so when I, uh, there was a fellow, a nice Nice person, a fair person, uh, working at the New York Times named Joe Nasera. He heard about my work, and he did a, an article about it, which that turned out to be the absolute low moment for GE, the recent test low moment, which was right around March 
ninth or so, 2009, or March 6th, I forget which exactly. And uh, the article is entitled, GE is in trouble with an exclamation mark. And it was, you know, about me. And he, he concluded in the end that GE would make it, uh, I guess, believing that the U.S. government and other governments would do what it did. But in the intervening time since March of 2009, we've had in Jeff Immelt and his team, his, his successor, John Flannery, a whole bunch of people who were quite happy to, you know, try to bring GE back from the brink and who were even happier to pay themselves tremendous amounts of money. Uh, GE, uh, Jeff Immelt, I think, is retired as he now is among uh, GE's largest individual shareholders. I believe the successor is up there as well. And where I come from in, uh, in the world of for-profit investing and, and business, I have absolutely no problem with management making a tremendous amount of money, if investors make a tremendous amount of money because of the management's work, and if the business is run in compliance with all laws. What I have a major league problem with is if the, the, you know, the business doesn't even get close to where its stock was trading back uh, in September of 2001 when Jeff Immelt took over at around 40 bucks a share. If you don't even get back to where you were, 17 years ago, uh, I have a hard time understanding why you sh- you deserve compensation in the hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, especially when what it appears Immelt and his team has done over the 17-year period is to you know shuffle the deck many many different ways. Uh, you and so, your you and uh, your your uh, Texas Instruments uh, calculator were able to detect. A major, a yawning gap between what GM, um, GE, sorry, was claiming in terms of its financial sol- solvency, and why it, it it deserved to hold its place as a leading company of the world, and you were able to detect that doing what you call simple arithmetic. Why was it? that GE was allowed to operate very for several years without anybody detecting that there was something wrong between its claims of financial stability and the real deal? Well, I think the answer is that there was then a perfect storm uh, that conspired to let uh, this mess continue down the trajectory, the downslope that it, that it has been on ever since 2001. And I think it has a series of elements. The first element is that, um, as in any market, uh, when there's an enormous demand for something exceeding the supply, people get sloppy about the merchandise. So in the case of highly rated, AAA rated corporate paper or for debt in the United States, there isn't much of it left. And there are a lot of people who, uh, who, who are restricted, a lot of funds and banks and multilateral institutions around the world that are restricted to only being able to buy AAA rated paper. So, uh, in the first instance, uh, GE, uh, was able, and I don't know how they, you know, bought off the rating agencies, but they were able, the debt rating agencies, to game the system and they offered the market a higher interest rate for paper that re- retained a AAA rating. So people flocked to that AAA paper, and they, and they basically felt, justifiably for a number of years, that they could sell as a much, much of this junk as they wanted to, and the rating agencies would still game it out and, and put a AAA stamp on this paper. So shame on the rating agencies, which is why, actually, when I initially recommended taking a short position against GE in 2007 and eight. I also recommended to people shorting Moody's, which was one of the publicly traded rating agencies in which Warren Buffett's firm had a big position. So part of it was gaming the rating agency. Part of it also was the fact that, that among the banks, the large banks that might lend to GE, GE had, a, uh, in many cases, a better credit rating than the banks. And when you, when you start thinking about providing loans and other things to a company as big as GE, uh, GE was in a position to say, listen, you know, this is your week, Deutsche Bank. You're going to give us money. And next week it'll be Citibank, and next week it'll be J.P. Morgan. Don't ask us any tough questions, because if you do, we'll just give the, the business to somebody else. 
same deal with, you know, they're constantly reshuffling assets and businesses, buying companies, selling companies, and they were able to, I think, you know, buy the loyalties of a lot of these banks who are in cutthroat competition with one another. So that gets the, we go to the rating agencies and the banks. Then you get to the, the stock market analysts. Well, being a stock market analyst in a, in a bank, and I was never such a person, is not a great job because uh, customers are never going to pay that much money for it. Uh, the laws don't allow you to, to really offer any quote, you're not any, to get or offer any inside information. You're dealing with public information that, that everyone else has. Um, and, you know, GE was a very important customer for most of the banks on Wall Street. So you weren't going to get uh, a, ma- a, a stock market analyst at a major bank uh, to write a scathing, in my view, a proper and scathing review of GE. So most of the research was positive. Uh, in addition to that, you had the classic uh, problem that I encountered dealing with a number of friends and contacts around the world who had ha- who owned GE stock because their parents or even their grandparents had bought it for nothing a long time ago. So if you're fortunate, you've got a Say hundred thousand dollars worth of GE stock, and your grandfather paid twenty bucks for it, uh, and you got you know, uh, let's just say your basis is twenty bucks. Uh, the standard refrain I would get out of people is, look, you know, if I sell this, I'm going to have to pay a gigantic tax, and where would I get the same dividend yield that I'm getting off GE stock? So you had this, you know, reluctance to, to exercise scrutiny on the part of a lot of individual investors who really, uh, there, there remain a lot of individual investors in this GE stock. Then you have the question of the various uh, academics, you know, the, the Harvard Bills of this world and, and other big uh, uh, academic types who might write about GE who are, or alternatively who might be engaged in doing research projects funded by GE. So the academia, academic group was, not, was loath to criticize GE. And the thing just got bigger and bigger and bigger. It really was. Actually, when I started on this, I'll break a little bit of news, and I won't say to to whom I did this, but I uh, was asked to to go to a major media network with a a proposal. So I I wrote up a a pitch, and I titled it Naked Emperor, you know, like that, uh, the emperor has no clothes. And that's basically what happened here with GE, that the people were afraid to tell the emperor of the multinational investing world that you were naked. You're walking around the street naked, and quite frankly, you had been taking a bath for quite a while, and you look pretty ugly. So, uh, but it's more, it's people more than to... people being afraid. I mean, we're talking here also about what is widely viewed as the law. The people <laughs> who were afraid in one way or the other recognized that there was something unlawful about the way GE was operating and decided they're not going to be the ones to bring it to light. What happened to them? Well, um, so I think that, uh, you know, that there are actually, ha- there have been a number of people who prior to my doing it went out and, and, and called out problems at different points in time. One of them was a guy called, is a guy called Bill Gross, who is one of the world's most famous debt investors. He, for a while, ran something called Pimco. Uh, and I'm not sure he's gone off somewhere else, but he challenged GE early in 2002, I believe. Um, and there was a big kerfuffle about that. But various times, there been people who, who've tried to challenge him. But what you encounter, when I did it, uh, when I, I ha- happened to have some, some friends, and I, I went to a person who used to be a very senior officer in the Security and Exchange Commission, running their largest office here in New York, and I had a meeting with him, and, I, and he was at a law firm and some other lawyers, and I took them through my analysis, and their initial react, reaction was, no one's ever going to go after GE. You don't understand this. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, listen, you know, GE is so big that it's so important. Uh, it has so many allies, so many friends stuck in so many places that no one's going to have the guts to take them on. I looked at him and I said, you're looking at somebody who has that, those guts. And because uh, I, like you, and I think like your listeners, um, I I got no problem with people playing fairly by the rules and winning and making enormous fortunes doing that. But where I have a massive problem is people breaking the rules 
forcing everybody else to play by the rules, punishing small infractions of the rules, but letting a gigantic fraud enrich many, many, many people around the world and, and leave us in a place where we are today where I think it's possible, you know, you can't predict the future, but it is possible that General Electric could go bankrupt and, you know, leave the rest of us who pay taxes uh, or have to deal with uh, the finances of this great country, leave the rest of us with liabilities that have been hidden from the public for so long. And I just don't think that's fair at all. I think we should be talking here. In the case of GE, you know, I don't, I don't like Barack Obama's use of the phrase teachable moment, but GE could actually be a teachable moment if we get into understanding the full course of its history, not simply tagging. I don't think Jeff Immelt alone is to blame for this, the former CEO. I think that if you go further back into time and reexamine Jack Welch's record, it is qu- quite possible that Jack Welch and his team also played fast and loose with the rules. So, you know, I think this is something we should study in some depth. Um, Right back into history, understand when the thing went off off course, understand uh, who's responsible, and then get into this talking about the Securities and Exchange Commission. I think you know those of us who've been involved doing takeovers and, and uh, other mergers and acquisitions inside the U.S. and around the world are rightly afraid of the SEC because when the SEC wants to make an issue of a problem, they can make a serious. They can make your life holy hell. Uh, but that said, the SEC, even the vaunted SEC, is, is I think, predominantly uh, responsible for civil matters, not criminal matters. It's the Department of Justice that gets involved with criminal matters. And even the SEC and the Department of Justice can be overmatched against, uh, or uh, undermatched, or whatever the right phrase is, against uh, a company as large as GE that can afford to hire as long as it remains solvent, uh, the most powerful lawyers around the world and firms that can dedicate far more in the way of resources to a matter or an investigation than even the Department of Justice can. So there needs to be, I think, a rebalancing in the thinking about how uh, the securities, publicly traded security, are regulated inside this country and around the world. And you said in the beginning, Yatrice, that that people don't really have much experience with with the markets. But that's because, uh, you know, many people actually still, especially if they're in the public sector, uh, many people have substantial interest in these public markets that they they better start understanding, and that's in the form of their pensions. I mean, these if you're a teacher, a uh, public school teacher, you're highly paid, and uh, when you look at uh, comparable figures, and you've got a pension. And many people in the private sector no longer have pensions. As a teacher, you got a pension, and it's probably invested in common stock. And I will bet you it's probably invested. It's probably invested in General Electric common stock because GE is so big. Most funds have a piece of it. And uh, you know, I think where our our children, our grandchildren, would be a lot better off is if we went back a bit to basics. And had people at a young age, and I'm talking, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade level and up, uh, begin to gain some exposure into basic, they used to call it home economics, and I'm not really talking about that so much, but, but how people, uh, live, how they spend, how they earn, how they save, basic essentials of, of understanding how securities are priced understanding how you figure out whether a company is risky or not risky, a credit is risky or not risky. These are skills that really should be shared with the coming generations because, unfortunately, we have saddled the coming generations with an enormous amount of debt. And in this reckoning, as interest rates start to rise, and they are rising, as they rise back to where they should be in relation to inflation to try to tame what seems to be resurging inflation, stock markets are going to crack. And uh, actually, when stock markets crack and downwards, and if you happen to have any cash left, uh, that's an opportunity for people who want to invest for the long run to, 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 to figure out which of the companies are companies that will possibly do well over time as we get back to, you know, a more balanced way. Of, uh, it, it's a skill, and it's, it's just like, you know, finding a deal at a supermarket. It's the same idea for stocks. You could do that. 
the bonds, you can do that. And these are skills that should not be ignored by these this rising generation. Instead, they should be nurtured. Well, GE uh, in 2007, 2008 had reached a crisis point, uh, not only in terms of its rising and out of control debts, but also in its leadership. And also we saw a crisis in the performance of the duties of oversight uh, agencies in that nobody really took GE to task. I mean, you did your research. You found yawning gaps between what GE was claiming and what truly was, you know, what was the real ugly picture. I mean, this sounds... This sounds almost ineffectual you know, as you talk about it, but the fact is, these are what you discovered was huge. I hate to borrow that term, uh, but huge criminality involved for which nobody was held to account. Nobody was uh, uh, made to pay the price for. Suddenly, uh, GE is being looked again uh, as looked at again as a a a pillar of the American business model yes it goes through some rough patches but you know they pull themselves together and they hire the right guy for the job and what do you know GE is in sound business practice again Nobody having been charged with any crimes, nobody having been fired, nothing has no damage. It has suffered no damage. And life goes on. How do, where do we have any kind of foothold or toehold in this business of making sure that this serves as an object lesson that this is not the way Wall Street is supposed to function. This is not the way that business is supposed to be done. And we still have no clue as the public as to what really happened there and how it was that these billions and billions and billions of dollars were essentially uh, forgiven. So it's a, it's also an untold story about how big companies enjoy privileges where their wrongful acts are expunged and excused and, and sheltered, and they're allowed to do things that the average person would never be allowed to do. Well, that's a big question. <laughs> Let me see if I can yeah. pick it apart a little bit with some answers. Um, I think in the case of GE, um, the efforts that perhaps I did instigate a little bit resulted in 2009 in General Electric paying a $50 million fine and spending $200 million uh, to study, you know, what was going on and to, to defend itself. Now, that is for General Electric, $50 million fine is like a nickel. To the most, to the most serious of your beings, it's not really all that serious. So you're right to say nobody, you know, there wasn't that much to pay for it. Now that said, General Electric has since then, over a number of years, attempted to exit from its largest business, the finance business, which is something I suggested that they needed to do way back in 2007 and 8. It took them a while to get out of it, and they were able, they have been able to, to so far get out of it in a period where interest rates were artificially suppressed by the central banks around the world, including the Federal Reserve Bank, which is our uh, central bank here in the United States, um, that action of suppressing the rates kept the prices high or higher, let's just say, for the many assets that GE had to divest out of its finance core. So, um, you know, that, that there's an analysis, excuse me, an analysis there. Savers, people who have savings, suffered in this period, 2000. Uh, nine forward, as this pushed interest rates low, retirees who, you know, many of them live off their interest on their CDs and other investments, 
suffered enormously. So why was that fair? Why was it fair to bail out the managers at GE who paid themselves richly? In some cases, in many cases, these people were making, you know, Five million a year, ten million, twenty million a year, and not simply the CEO. Many other people inside this large multinational company were making tremendous amounts of money in a period where all the rules had been bent. So we haven't yet had any uh, recompense there, any real scrutiny on all of that. Um, and the question, the other area, which is one that makes me recoil in horror, when I hear people talk about business government cooperation. Remember that Jeff Immelt was put in charge by Barack Obama of the stimulus program, administering the stimulus program that didn't work, cost us a trillion dollars. When I see highly paid executives intermingling with most often lowly paid senior government officials who need to think about what they're going to do after they leave their powerful government positions, what I think of immediately is corruption, endemic corruption. And businesses like a General Electric that has so much going on around the world with leaders of so many governments and also is tapping into uh, various slush funds that are multilateral agencies like the uh, uh, Overseas Private Investment Corporation that helps you make Americans make foreign investments or the IMF or the World Bank or other things like that. When I see multinationals interacting with these types of people, it makes me very, very nervous. And, and I, I begin to apply... I jokingly refer to, we've talked about this before, or tells first law, I look at, I punch in a General Electric with the word fraud, or I punch in the Siemens with the word fraud, and I start to see many, many uh, prosecutions and ongoing investigations. And I just think business government cooperation is a horrible idea. I think businesses need to do what is best for their shareholders and their employees in their communities. I think governments need to protect the citizenry. And where you have an intersection between the two is dangerous ground, is rife with potential for corruption, particularly internationally. And so GE has gotten itself involved in many, many issues. There's a, a case over in uh, India I'm familiar with because I spent a fair amount of time in India uh, involving a, uh, a whistleblower whose name is Sema, S-E-E-M-A, Sapra, S-A-P-R-A. Now, she's controversial. Uh, and in part, no doubt, because she attacked GE. She went to work for GE. She was a, is a lawyer. She was at GE trying to suss out fraud and help the people at GE suss out fraud. At the same time, General Electric was involved in a very large locomotive project with the government of India. And in the course of doing her work, she felt that she had uncovered fraud, going right up to the highest level, possibly involving the man who currently is the CEO of GE, Mr. Flannery. And uh, so she tried to expose it, and, and there was a vicious retaliation against her. She was thrown in prison. Uh, she's fighting like crazy. Uh, we'll see what the truth is over there. That's just one case. You know, in some of these countries, when a General Electric, when Jeff Immel flew into India or flies into a foreign country, particularly a poor uh, uh, country that has, let's say, big infrastructure projects it needs to do, but th- not the money to pay for it, um, Lots of people start putting their hands up, and uh, it is a very dangerous business model to get involved with that uh, because there's so many different ways that you can you can break, whether they're U.S. laws, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or local laws, or get involved with young people, or you know do what you think is decent diligence, but you know you can't check everything, and you may discover that uh, your your local business partner is a crook or that. Uh, the you know, land you thought that was pristine, in fact, is tainted with poisonous environmental problems. You, there are all sorts of grave risks operating in these countries, and I think GE um, was too risk-prone. Indeed, one of the things I noticed that set me off back in 2006 and 7, there's a section of what's called uh, the 10K report, an annual report for a corporation like GE, which is called its risk factor section. And what my experience dealing with those reports, uh, you know, when I have clients putting them out and stuff, you get your top lawyers around the table, and they'll tell you, look, what you want to do in the risk factor section is you want to make that as long as possible. You want to lay out every conceivable risk that you see, whether with your company, your industry, the competition, the, you know, the countries in which you operate, you name it. You want to lay it all out there and, because you want to think clearly about the risks you're taking, 
but also because you want to have a defense in the event that one or more of these risks bites you, that you told potential investors before they invested that there were risks. So when I looked, I expected the first time I took a gander at GE's risk factor section, I thought, you know, it's, it's, I better sit, buckle my seatbelt because it's probably going to be 200 pages long. And to my shock and horror, I believe, if remembering now, it's been a while, I think that the total number of words in the risk factor section was 666, a bad number, but also, uh, you know, that's like two and a half pages. It's, I, my, my view back then in 2007, as the world was teetering over an abyss, uh, that risk factor section back then should have been 25, 35 pages. Now I think it's a bit longer. I just checked this morning. The risk factor section has mushrooms. But uh, I don't think the management at GE thought clearly enough about the risks. And I also don't think the directors at GE did their job. Um, and I, I have some sympathy that, you know, the, the very powerful men and women who were directors, and that's not a full-time job. Many of them had full-time jobs. Many of them had other board responsibilities. I don't think it's so easy to be a director of one of these gigantic companies and devote even you know two days a week to it. Uh, when you you have to rely on management, management has these legions, these armies of accountants and lawyers at their beck and call. Um, they're going to be a lot more familiar with the situation than you will ever be. Uh, I think there needs to be a better system for regulating some of these very large companies, particularly if they're complex and if they're international. And, you know, the various directors, uh, you know, I think most people in the audience here would be very happy to be paid what a GE director is paid. Last I checked, for part-time work, that was about half a million dollars a year. Now, I don't know what it is. It might have gone down since then or it might have gone up since then. That's a lot of money to pay for a part-time job. And I don't think the directors discharge their responsibilities properly, particularly in the period 2009 forward. You know, they've had a lot of time here to get in front of these problems, and they didn't. And now we Well, see... yes, but at the same time, you know, we are presented with the inescapable truth, which is when you have this kind of money, you could misbehave and still be assured that nobody's going to really put you in jail, whether it's a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. Everybody is talking money. Money is what is at the root of all of this. And to prosecute a General Electric is to say, well, you are, uh, in terms of defense, well, you are impinging on our efforts to continue to make money. You can't take us out of the scene by prosecuting us and making our lives so difficult. You need to give us as much room as we would need to correct our mistakes. And, of course, those mistakes are never corrected. So is GE the kind of poster company for money talks, and everything else walks because with this kind of money uh, being generated by a company to the point where the company itself becomes a huge part of the, the, the financial or the revenue stream of a nation, it's practically immune to prosecution. Would you, what would you say about that contention? Well, so I think what's going to happen here, what could happen with GE, is that um, that the prosecutions may come after the fact. In other words, where GE is now, if you look at their most recent annual report, that I talked about tangible book value, the, the, you know, the, 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 the amount of uh, common equity that's the, the bed should be the bedrock of a company. Uh, the common equity that's there to protect the shareholder has shrunk in size. Uh, under ML, while at the same time, the liabilities have mushrooms. Now, that's just thinking about GE as if GE were a company based right there in your apartment, Beatrice, you know, just one, let's say, large company in your apartment. Um, but GE is far more complicated than that. GE is, a, is in many, many nations around the world, and some nations are far more tough on uh, malfeasance than the United States is. Uh, 
uh, we'll give you a few examples. Uh, France and Germany and Switzerland are examples of countries where if you go bankrupt, depending on how you go bankrupt in those countries, the, the local leader of the business can go to jail for that, depending on how you go bankrupt. And so unfortunately for GE, they have very large exposures in France and Germany in particular. Switzerland's a small country, but they have some exposures in Switzerland. But gigantic exposures because they employ, employ a lot of people and have employed a lot of people in France and in Germany. And when a company goes bankrupt and lays off people in a country like France or Germany, there are enormous social costs and penalties. In addition, when you go bankrupt and leave behind uh, environmental messes, that you should have cleaned up. I'm thinking here, and I don't know how they've done cleaning up the mess along the Hudson River here in New York. Uh, but, you know, there are large legacy pollution problems at General Electric uh, scattered across the Northeast and, in, and around the United States in many different places. Were GE to go bankrupt, who's going to pay those bills to get that land back, uh, you know, and it pristine to the way it should be? Um, who's going to pay for the underfunded pension plans? GE. GE used to have inside of its pension plans, uh, I want to say approximately 5% or so was the stock of GE. So, uh, you know, if GE stock were to be worthless, that creates an even bigger hole in the pension plan. So I think what could well happen here is that GE could find, there was a, since the last time we talked about it, uh, they've had to admit uh, Friday, and it was picked up Sunday, that uh their involvement with a company, uh, I want to say it's the old Washington Mutual, uh, with subprime mortgages is now the subject of a maturing legal action, low these, whatever it is, 11 years later, uh, into potential malfeasance that could cost you some money today or, you know, this year. Uh, substantial money. They have problems with their pension plan and other problems. So, um, if GE were to suffer the following fate, that they would be kicked out of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, um, and as that happened, the people will begin to get dig, dig more deeply into the finances and discover other holes. You could find General Electric. You could find itself in a, in a position akin to Enron, where the directors are left in you know no other uh, position to protect their own interests than to put the thing into into bankruptcy. Now, I want to hasten to add that I have no investment positions uh, against GE. Uh, involving GE in any way, shape, or form. So I'm not out here advocating uh, a direction for GE because I have something to gain from it personally. I'm just giving my own uh, objective analysis here. But I do think there is there is a probability. Is it 50%? Is it 20%? Uh, is it 10%? There is a probability that events could move against General Electric very swiftly and place the directors in a, in, a, in a place where they have to put the thing into bankruptcy to protect their interests. And, you know, when you think about a General Electric, one of the problems that GE has today in 2018, in my opinion, is it has it's too complicated and it has too many legacy employees and legacy relationships, too many places in legal jurisdictions where it is tough to fire people. And, you know, it could be that reorganization of GE through bankruptcy is the only way to put its businesses back on the growth trajectory that they should be on. Uh, I, th I think the other thing I would say is that when you have as many restructurings as General Electric has had, I mean, when Jack Welch uh, became CEO back in, I think, April of 81, he immediately launched a gigantic restructuring and, and downsizing of General Electric. But he wasn't in the business of, re, of doing that every every year. Under ML, particularly in his final period, it seemed like every single year there would be yet another reorganization or this or that, making it very difficult to understand what exactly was inside GE. It was a constantly changing collection of businesses and interests and joint ventures and projects. Um, almost never consistently presented. This, you know, this from a, a group of businesses, uh, very large, lots of profit, lots of cash at different points of time, and therefore the ability, if they wanted to, to say, look, you know, we know we've been through a lot here. 
we know you're having trouble understanding what it is that you own. We're going to present for you. We're going to go back and go the extra mile and say, look, not only are we going to give you five years of history, uh, granular roll-up of the businesses into the consolidated whole, we're going to go back 10 years. We're going to show you by business line what we do, and we're going to show you by geography what we do, and we're going to really help you understand how it is that we make money, how we profit from the risks we're taking. They have done none of that. And, uh, you know, now there are certain checklists that professional investors have. And when you see, you know, earnings misses, you see management departures, you see reorganizations, you see SEC investigations, you see shareholder lawsuits. Nobody credible in business would look at that and say, oh, yeah, this is fine. <laughs> this, but at the same time, at the same time, why not just liquidate the business? Order the business liquidated, and you know, have them solve that problem, and keep moving. You know, the the idea is, why should a nation, why should an entire nation, be held hostage to this promise of continual improvement and self inspection and blah blah blah? And there's way too much energy. Uh, uh, spent in, in that useless exercise, the job of government is not to rehabilitate uh, a business that keeps tanking. And in, in doing so, they now have a ripple effect within the entire industry. So is it fair to other businesses that may have had difficulties, but they corrected them, is it fair to the business world? Is it fair to the taxpayer? Is it fair to investors that this uh, alpha terrible called <laughs> GE is allowed to continually misbehave, disregard the law, and continually show that it does not have the capacity to correct itself? Shouldn't it just be allowed to die? Well, that's why I'm saying, yeah, I mean, you and I are sort of saying the same thing in that uh, my wrinkle is I think it is possible, and the reason you would put it into bankruptcy, it is possible that the value of GE's liabilities is significantly greater than the value of its assets. So when you liquidate a business and you have liabilities greater than assets, that's a huge problem. <laughs> that's why you have to well, put it into have bankruptcy. To, we, we have to leave it there today, Charles. We're out of time. But this is a subject, of course, we'll come back to because the bottom line, as we had discussed earlier, the bottom line is what does this all mean to the average person? You talked about the retiree or the person who has a pension. And are we looking at really now the, the barrel of the gun, the gun being the, the, uh, a crash? And it, it, is it smart to say, well, yes, there's going to be a major shakeup in the market, and we already have the the reason, and it's called GE. Certainly, well, there should be some kind of approach. I don't know what it is. And so I'll, I'll come back to you and ask, what should be done now? And this is a crisis. It's not being uh, broadcast as a crisis. Um it's a global crisis, what happens to GE and what becomes of GE. And it also raises the question about being enabled, uh, uh, an enabled crisis, enabled by uh, an unwilling government, uh, the power of the company itself to keep everybody in line and to compel them to do what they want the, the uh, regulators to do. It's an awful capitalist story. So we'll come back to you, and we'll continue the conversation. And I know people want to ask questions, but first, it's always important to get some background to kind of frame our discussion, our further discussion. But thanks so much, Charles, for your enlightening uh, contributions and the work that you continue to do. And thanks for being with us today. <laughs> 